Erica sits in the grave for me. I know, not the most engaging opinion in the strata of reviews. But for middle ground's sake, I'll surmise it as this. It's on the better side of meh, and that's okay. Erica is an experiment to the FMV format, as Flavorworks adds their own flavor to the mix. Yes, I know, I hate myself too. Despite my seventh or so playthrough, I can't get Erica out of my head. The way it plays, the way it's experienced, and the story it tries to tell fascinates me on several fronts. One, of genuine excitable intrigue, and the second as a disappointing narrative riddled with missed possibilities. But before we get into that, my spoiler-free Too Long Can't Watch review is this. It's a fun game that utilizes interactivity beyond the two-choice system. You can turn a key, lock your door, turn on a lamp, generally interact with the scene around you. What you choose to interact with or not changes the story you experience. The controls you may find clunky at first, and it is known to have stability issues, at least I encountered that on PC. But I encourage you to look past that and allow yourself to be immersed in a relatively different full motion video game. Additionally, I want to take this opportunity to bring up some warnings. Erica potentially uses mental health disorders as a plot motivator with a debatable lack of care or understanding. The resources I use to help develop my ideas and inform my opinions come from articles and videos that I will link in the description below. I'll be going over it in very light detail because of my unfamiliarity, but please be forewarned. If you decide to leave here, thank you so much for stopping by. Erica is a fun FMV that I recommend anyone give a try, or if you're waiting for a sale and want to watch a quick run through, I do a three episode let's play of it on my channel. I know, self advert, bad look, but algorithm. I'll link the playlist in the description as well. Thank you for joining me and I will see you in the next one. For those sticking around, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's bum bum. Flavorworks' inventive reimagining of interactivity had me embarrassingly giddy. That is so cool. Oh, what the fuck? Oh, I'm blown away. This is cool. I love it. I'm digging it. I'm in. For some reason, striking the Zippo and cutting seamlessly back into the scene felt wonderfully dynamic. Every moment, frame by frame, was kept interesting, giving me a sense of anticipation for the next activity. So well blended were the interactions that I sometimes didn't realize it was my turn to do something. The whole ethos flavor works is rather than films which i show don't tell this is about play don't say so if we can put an action on a tactile choice like here by breaking the fourth wall i somehow felt more connected with erica like i was stepping into her shoes each interaction solidified that connection erica is fundamentally tailored to askew our perception of the story by forcing us to lean in strictly on erica's perspective in doing so the game mechanics and narrative structure complement each other well that's erica's strength in this pick a picture scene, we're doing more than picking a picture. Erica's father sets up lore about how our parents met, magic and psychics, and us as Erica has an opportunity to prove his lore dump true or false. In this scene, we get an air of mystery while simultaneously learning the game mechanics through experience. By guessing the wrong picture, we're given this scene. Oh, disaster. Don't worry. I still think you're magic. And guessing right, we get this scene. See, magic. It's important to note here that no matter what happens, this choice has no game altering effect, albeit an achievement if you guess right. Instead, we're told that what happens next should be interpreted literally or not. How we experience a narrative from this point on is shaped by our father's reinforcing words and how we interpret his words. The game toys with our character perspective alongside an unreliable narrator as part of their game mechanic. Marry that with a system of meaningful, tactile, in-scene interactions, and you get an FMV that encourages you to be Erica. To see how your interactions meaningfully dictate perception, let's go through this early scene during our introduction to Delphi House. A quick pause here, I wanted to address this in case of future linguistic beratement. I pronounce Delphi as Delphi throughout the video. My apologies if it bothers you, it kinda bothers me too. I went with the FMV's pronunciation. Go to Delphi House. Delphi House. All right, for Delphi. Delphi! If it doesn't bother you, think Zeus. If it does, then Hades to you. I'm sorry, I'm joking, I'm a joke. Back to the video. The moment we enter the institution, we first see the call bell. How we interact with the bell also dictates how our relationship develops with first name Sergeant, last name Blake. I'm Sergeant Blake. 
If we decide to ring incessantly, he'll stop us, and if not, he'll do it himself. Either way, Blake, Hannah, Toby, and Christy have a hidden relationship point system, and yes, you will see affected scenes depending on those developments, which makes it fun to see both negative and positive outcomes. While that may sound like a no-brainer, trust me when I say some FMVs showcase relationships as a meaningless stat. Also, I want to mention this because of their great attention to detail in their film direction. Pavley, you did an obsessive thing with this. Depending which way you're looking this at the important. end of this sequence will determine... All right, I'm going to look to the right. Okay, look to the right. And then she's looking to the she's right. She's looking to the right. If I'd been looking to the left, she would have been looking to the That's left. That's continuity, man. I actually noticed that in my multiple playthroughs, thinking to myself, did they account where a player looked? If not, I'd be disappointed, but you know, it's kind of expected, so whatevs. Yet, they considered it, because continuity matters. The sense of curated detail is sprinkled throughout the game. Like this eye track that follows your cursor, it's always cool to notice them on your subsequent playthroughs. Back at the lobby, we have several options here to pursue our prancing masked friends, overhear a conversation down the hallway, or pick up the phone. You won't be able to explore it all in one go, and some events affect the game's outcome more than others, but the important thing to note is that all of it matters when conveying to us, the players, as I've probably said a million times now, your in-scene interactions shape how you understand Erica's story. But of course, not all is Oleander in terms of beauty. Actual Oleander is incredibly toxic. The whole plant is uber dangerous, and ingestion leads to horrid symptoms. I mean, like, Erica has some notable technical issues and unfortunate design decisions. But it's like also a pretty pink flower in that it looks great. I may not know my flowers, but I know a bitch when I see one! Ah, uh, bad. Metaphor turned awful analogous explanation of the simile, but okay, gripe time. Time to gripe. This is the gripening. I think I like the word gripe because it kind of reminds me of grape, but if grape and gripe is my inside joke and no one knows the context of that, that I'm just spouting out words without context, I really hate not being able to load and have multiple saves. There. I said it. It's like bad artistic mojo when you question intentional design decision like that because I mean like I understand the idea about not having multiple save files, I hear you. You want the player to complete a run through first, you want the player to have that experience unique to them unfiltered by the urge to redo or replay. It makes sense especially in maintaining the integrity of a movie format, but I'ma say something that's gonna get me drawn proctored but whatevs. FMV stands for full motion video. Game. Not full movie video game, game. I can't say it without the game at the end, but while maintaining the movie format may sound reasonable at first, I implore all developers of all FMVs from our galaxy to the next, please consider that we are more than just an audience. We are players. We are a driving force. We are the user input that takes your system from A to B in hopes of a dopamine hit that communicates to our brains. This was fun. This fun game. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> allow me to be part of the millions of voices assuring you it's okay to incorporate skips and load points. In terms of lack of accessibility, another striking example saddens me, and that is there is no way to pause between choices. The game keeps moving with or without you. Sure, you can hit pause at any time, but the choices are then obscured. The developers confirm that you can run multiple scenes as an omniscient observer, never having to engage with the game's dialogue choices. Hit play and watch the default do its thing. While interesting, it doesn't serve to advance the game or the genre in any meaningful way. Sure, it's seamless and immersive regarding movie pacing, but it's an FMV game. The goal is to play the game, not to run it as a hands-off experience. You could do the same thing by adding a do-nothing option to serve the same function. At least, that way you could implement a pause on choice being mindful of accessibility. As mentioned earlier, I played using a mouse and keyboard, the functionality of which was indeed clunky and took some getting used to. Again, this isn't a knock on their daringness to experiment with other modes of play, but design should also incorporate for ways to adjust for those factors. For example, instead of light tracing to indicate which motion to move for an outcome, use an arrow to indicate direction. While you're at it, draw a glow or hue around objects needed for movement for better visualization. Take this Toby slap moment. I'm swiping anywhere on screen, hoping a slap will occur. Otherwise, a wrong input takes me back another hour just to get here. And it works because I swiped over space, I don't know, I couldn't tell ya. Remember, the game constantly reminds you to interact with objects in the scene. We need consistency here, or at the very least, input clarification. 
Maybe include a button press instead of solely relying on on-screen motion. Maybe be mindful of where character conversation choices are on screen. Sure, having words flutter around fills empty space, but for a game limited on time, play's consistency is key. Attacking all over the screen with mouse clicks is just, it's not as fun as you think. As a side note, I should probably mention this as well, touch interactivity is sort of Flavorworks' modus operandi, so my suggestions may seem counter to their company philosophy, just to get that out of the way. Unfortunately, despite all these years, Erica still has stability issues and bugs and crashing issues. I'll only mention the stuff I encountered, I'll parse through this briefly as well as no game is perfect. One glaring issue was during long play sessions, I would get poor to non-existent responses during end scene interactions. This scene is near the end when you enter the Oleander Grove, you have to strike the Zippo to progress the scene. However, it ain't working here. I try several clicks, drags, pause, and unpause, but for best results, reboot the game. You hate to hear it, but that's the best solution as per all else I mentioned. Your mileage will vary because I was also recording when this happened, mayhaps that was the issue. Lastly, constant in-scene interactions can actually jar up and break up the game's flow, especially if interactions aren't narratively motivated. It's one thing to search for clues in your turned upside down home or sneak through corridors trying to remain undetected or peer through a peephole hoping against hope the jump scare doesn't happen. It's another to fiddle with like a briefcase to open through and sift through. Searching through vinyl isn't particularly interesting, nor is meticulously opening a doll box. Take this pencil sketching scene. The way it's shot makes it unguided and unwieldy in perspective. In a sense, you're mouse dragging all over hoping you're doing it right. Save the mouse, save the gamer. Some interactions could have easily been reduced to one or two player inputs. Admittedly, this is nitpicky as it's not as prevalent throughout the game, but you know, it's there, so had to bring it up. As for the music, it's great! Alrighty, thanks for watching, you've been the best, you're the greatest, you're the best. Okay, so out of fear of copyright claims, just take my word for it, okay? It's uber dope. The music was composed by Austin Wintry. His work spans Journey, The Banner Saga, Assassin's Creed Syndicate, his portfolio is incredible. And he's a multi-award winner off of Erica soundtrack, so there's that. As someone who can't hold rhythm, Here's how best I can describe it. Erica has an actual theme, which is honestly more than I expected for an FMV. Wintry's clever use of strings create an atmosphere of disjointed eeriness that helps bring the Delphi house alive. At times, the music sounds otherworldly, as Wintry manipulates melody to represent Erica's fugue state. The composition for Aria for Delphi, a jazz track, was a nice touch too. Aria for Delphi would play during moments of difficult to interpret dream states, further adding to this world's disoriented reality. The record-scratching jazz also worked to muddy the time period in which Erica takes place, which is great work from both music and creative direction. Comparatively, when first booting up Erica, you immediately notice how lackluster the main menu is visually compared to the full-blown orchestra playing over it. It's kind of surreal. I'll place links in the description so you know you can judge the music for yourself. The music is great. Dare I say, better than this story deserves. Some of my favorites are Know Thyself, Aria for Delphi, A Lost Home, and What's Real. Good stuff, gotta hear it. Together we can save her. Together we can set her free. There are excellent performances in here. Every actor buys in and commits to their roles well. Some areas are played up, but I attribute that to the script. With a cast this large, I was worried that some performances would dip, but far from it. There were characters I wanted to know more of. This FMV could have utilized their talents 
more than I think this script even realizes. Writing aside, I wanted to know more about characters like Toby, Lucian Flowers, and Christy due to their performances alone. Sasha Frost as Hannah bled through, pun intended, as warm, inviting, and helpless. Despite lacking on-screen time, any moment she was on was not wasted. Frost portrays Hannah with both trusting innocence and later doubtful horror as her symptoms worsen, and as they do, Frost's tone of voice shifts to that of desperate realization. I'm... I'm getting an operation. Uh, on the plus side, the drugs are great. Chelsea Edge nails it with Toby right from the get-go. Toby's standoffish, piercing glare kills. But when reeled in, we see an apparent vulnerability stemming from unraveling a deadly conspiracy. Even without enough corresponding scenes to patchwork her character arc, she edges, pun more intended, I hate everything about me, a smile, resigning gratefulness, and bringing her character full circle. Terence Maynard's Lucian maintains that balance between comfort and untrustworthiness, often with a subtle watchful gaze when he thinks we're not looking, but we see you. I mean, he kills it. And them. Finally, Holly Earl showcases range despite the screenplay not doing her any favors. Because Erica's our focal point, we can't help but pay close attention to Earl's every move, and I just admire how naturally she engages with her scene partners and her surroundings. In moments of vulnerability, she draws us in, snapping us back and forth from different realities. Her performance was at its best when she's confrontational and an agent through narrative decisions. Are you kidding? Sorry. Both know that's not true. She's my mother. I have a right to know. I don't believe in magic. There are just not enough moments like this, unfortunately, and it kills me. Earl plays Erica with measured reservation, yet when the moment calls for different emotions, she delivers on every note. You know plenty was asked of her when playing out all these different scenes, and that alone you have to appreciate. As with Wintry's music, they bring it. Thankfully, the directing and cinematography work is no slouch either. So well is the movie shot and crafted, it masks many narrative low points and plot holes. So seamless are their transitions with gameplay that you almost forget how underdeveloped certain scenes are. Incredible is the cast that you may look past the dicey character motivations that set up a rushed climax with a poor payoff. Yet, as I said earlier, I can't stop thinking about Erica's story. I liked where it was headed, just not where it ended up. If you don't look, you'll never know. Find Elodie Carter. See for yourself. Writing for an FMV must be like writing that 125 page script, typical screenplay length, and then writing another 250 more, all the while trying to avoid plot holes that create new, unexpected branches, possibly unwanted. And when writing for movies, there's a set structure. For FMVs, I imagine, you know, it's that and then some. My point being is that it's tough, it's a tough gig. Perhaps it's simpler than I give it credit for, a rudimentary A to N script with tiny deviations in between, but I'd be remiss, and I think many people would be, to say that such work comes easy. And I don't want to do Erica that failing. When it comes down to it, I enjoyed this game. All the critiques I have for it come from a place of appreciation. All that said, Erica's story for me presents the illusion of a good story masked behind the formula of a full motion video game. The premise of which is stronger than its delivery. My most prevailing problem with its story is that no matter how much you replay it, you'll come to realize there's little narrative depth, more so shallow waters. For the uninitiated, let's go over what is Erica's story. Much of this information is from their fandom wiki and other forums, of course I will also link that below. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find the screenplay for Erica, nor do I think one exists that is widely accessible online, so apologies if exact details are missing. Again, we're just going over the crucial highlights. Enter Erica Mason, a young woman who suffers from post-traumatic stress from witnessing the unexplained murder of her father when she was just a child. Her mental torment manifests as reoccurring memories. However, she's able to draw out those muddied memories into countless illustrations that decorate her apartment walls. This is all we know of her living state, which is pretty bare bones. We get to greet her neighbor. He should probably keep it. 
But that's about it. We don't know what Erica does for a living or other coping mechanisms if her illustrations amount to anything if she's tried solving the case herself, nor do we see the consequences or joys of a reclusive lifestyle, what's her favorite color, if she prefers Friendster over Live Journal, disappointing on the exposition front to say the least. Then seemingly out of the blue, she receives a bloody package. Sergeant Balake Lake. What? informs us the man's hand belongs to a staff member, a one Akal Johar of the psychiatric hospital Delphi House. The very same house Dear Papa was murdered in. Detective Rambo, of course, then suggests I, we, Erica hold up there and wait for all of this to blow over. Terrible idea lacking proper character motivation, but whatever, let's play ball, the premise is interesting. From dancing TikTok fiends overheard rumors of whodunit to, oh wait, Daryl Mama was committed to Delphi House by Dearest Papa? We stay the night, because of course we do, and then become saddled in with more dreams of yesteryear. When we awake the following day, we meet our three central residents of Delphi House, our supporting cast, Christy, Toby, and Hannah. After a bit of back and forth, Can I have one? No. Hannah has a bloody coughing fit. Following this incident, we go to our morning meet and greet with the one Dr. Lucian Flowers, the co-founder of Delphi House and supposed uncle figure. I should have been there for you. I should have done more. I was just a little girl. I didn't have anyone. I only thought about myself. I was selfish, destructive. There's no excuse. I'm sorry. He was dad's BFF before he hit the big sleep. However, you'd never know it due to poor character setup. For those in the know, no. Pictures of beautiful Terence Minot's face in our Protex journal, or a portrait of him in the hallway don't count. In fact, they steer up more plot holes than resolute plot connections. Then the copper and doctor suggest, nay, peer pressure like all good law enforcement and psychiatrist types, sarcasm, don't hate me, to try their pseudoscience regression therapy. I don't know. Erica, please. Of course, almost immediately, I knew something was up. So I said, no, take a hike, adios, heading home. Throwing discretion is a better part of valor aside, I said yes for this show and tell. As you expected, we're bombarded with images meant to stimulate false memories, conjure up confusing thoughts without genuine empirical evidence, and as luck would have it. What the hell did you do to me? It's okay. You were drawing. You were drawing the whole time. Whatever the outcome, we meet Dr. Flowers in the flower garden, where he then shows us where Ma's buried. Something you'd think Erica would be in the know about, plot holes amounting, but okay, whatever, pressing on. We are then asked to make another significant decision in terms of who to pair up with. Toby, the spitfire accomplice, Hannah, the conformist, and Christy, the only one who knows what the hell's going on around here. Whoever you choose unravels an aspect, a piece of the story, like a puzzle incomplete, unable to be made whole in one playthrough. Thankfully, you have my smooth brain to give you the spark notes. If you take the Toby route, you learn this. You're looking for adventure. Is that it? Fine. Come with me. Toby takes us to a secret attic that leads to a beautifully painted wall. Toby speaks of Colts and the girl who died here just before we got here, and that a bloody nose is a bad sign. She says good Dr. Flowers trades futures for wealth. And then we, Erica, drink till delirious from what we think is alcohol. But discerning eyes will see it's actually a purplish pink. It's flower juice, however that's made. And then we awake outside Delphi House, pedal in tow. The Hanel route, the seemingly more natural route, brazenly pits us in a creepy perfume chem lab. Here we learn that way back when, the oracles of Delphi grounded Oleander, sniffed it, got super stoned, and did fortune telling. Now here at Psychiatric Hospital Delphi, they turn it into a perfume. Either way, we skip out on learning about Hannah as a character and head to our bedroom. With Pop and Oleander e-juice freshly ground, we hotbox our room and get that chem-induced sleep. And in that slumber, we dream of a ritual. Jeez, finally. Get up. You've got mail, and it looks expensive. Before we check our mail, there's one last route we need to visit, and that is the Christie route. I guess I could go meet some other girls. Okay, I love this for her. Erica immediately goes for the cake for lunch. That's my mood always. Sweets will be the death of me. Keep in mind that's one of the few instances we see a written personality, maybe the only 
instance, we see a written personality for Erica, so savor it, folks. It's a desert out there. Choosing Christy leads to lunch together, after which we volunteer as a cleanup crew. What did you mean, at lunch, when you said I was a butterfly? Oh, yeah. Well, you're not a rabbit, or a deer, or a fox. Noticing our entrenched curiosity, Christy takes us to a back room where she reaches for a red tape and explains there's a conspiracy afoot. Later, we enter Christy's room where she immediately tapes her closet and tells us to look under her pillow. There we see her magnus opus, a deer, fox, rabbit, butterfly on repeat, a near perfect copy page by page. I like the rabbits best. That's cause she is the rabbit. Hannah the deer, Toby the fox if I had to hearken I guess. We circle back to our room later that evening, and as luck would have it, we encounter Hannah. No matter how you spin this, they want us oleander intoxicated for magic's sake. Despite what's said here, she leaves the purifier by our bedside where you're free to bin it or vape it. No matter what you choose here, you get the ritual dream and petal toe. Back to the main timeline we go, all paths eventually lead us to our infamous mail delivery scene. And if you're thinking, damn, one bad thing happened when Erica got mail, Certainly Erica would know a second bad thing of equal or lesser value may happen here too. Unfortunately, all characters our protag included are written to be constantly none the wiser. Having received the tattooed skin of a one Carl Steinbeck, the night manager, we're called in for another parent-teacher conference. We learn Steinbeck's tattoo is from the Temple of Apollo phrase, know thyself because branding is everything. And when we bring up that the doll was gifted to us by Lucian Flowers, no alarm bells ring off in Sergeant Blake's head. Okay, red flag. We start to notice Dr. Flowers peering at us menacingly. Another red flag. In another playthrough, I brought up how Erica's birthmark matches that of the doll. Again, no takers. If you're wondering at this point, where is Erica's sense of urgency, agency, and general awareness of solving this damn thing herself? Then you're starting to see where my frustrations are amounting. Sergeant Blake then suggests we search Erica's apartment again just to be extra extra sure we didn't miss anything. Here he's hoping for a Hail Mary, a smoking gun, the one clue that blows his case wide open. Instead, we find Erica's apartment ransacked, Steinbeck's dead body, and the next apartment over, and come to find out, our neighbor was in on it the whole time. This moment genuinely surprised me because it's dumb. It's a super lame twist and it really stifles narrative potential. If you thought the plot holes couldn't get deeper, it's like they went out of their way to dig it themselves. There are bits of how Steinbeck died here, a note in his breast pocket, Maya calling on the landline, fridge, oleander, e-juice, but all of it's ultimately, sadly, insignificant. What happens next depends on which of the girls you make nice with. If you and Toby are two peas in a pod, then Toby drags you along to watch Hannah carted away for an operation. Here we get some Hannah lore. They're taking Hannah for some sort of operation. She grabbed some shitty foster home. Fake depression just to get out of it and wound up here. Which is a fucking stupid line. Not gonna get into why, because obviously, but it's one of those moments where you could cut a line and the story remains unaffected. Together you storm Hannah's room and search for a box full of oleander petals. Toby has a nosebleed, uh-oh. Much is the same for Hannah's route, but this time you get a bit of combo, and I mean a bit. It's a shame that Hannah is such an afterthought. In the morning, when I looked in my hand and- Time to go. In the bedside cabinet, in the box, I was holding them when I woke up. Unfortunately, again, she just tells us what we already know about oleander petals, bad dreams, and conspiracy. Eventually, we find the box and Toby squares up because she wants it, and then there's an opportunity to slap her, so we slap. The Christy route takes us for a bit of a loop. We cut to Christy's room where she has us signing a get well card. We can write whatever we want here, which is a great touch. And then she shows us that the red tape she used earlier is broken. Whoa-oh. There'd be a secret door in there. A quick reminder. Toby's route shows a secret attic passage, while Christy's secret door is here. Where's Hannah's secret door, you ask? Well, that one is a bit more cleverly placed. I'll get there in a bit. Afterwards, we head to Hannah's room and long behold, Toby's looking for a pedal box. She finds it and her nose bleeds. All of this leads to our parent-teacher conference number three, this time with first name chief, last name inspector. Why aren't we doing it at the police station? You've been through enough, Erica. We just want you to be as comfortable as possible. 
Red flag number a million and a half, and at this point, I'm just smashing my head against the wall. Here we learn about Maya Green. She was a former patient at Delphi House and our neighbor because of course she was. They explain that Maya Green was a close friend with our mother and probably killed our father. As the story goes, Dr. Flowers informs us when Deer's mama died, Maya Green broke into the dispensary, overdosed, and died. You're lying. I'm afraid not. We are investigating the possibility that there's been some mistake. Gaslighting. We gaslighting here? A phone call comes in, letting the good old Sarge know there's been an intruder break-in in Delphi House. Both he and Dr. Flowers join in the rescue while you deal with your nosebleed. Nosebleed? Oh no! After cleaning ourselves up a bit, and if we're quick enough to head downstairs, we catch the chief inspector in his death throes. Yes, tis Christie's old man. Taking a peek through his desk, we can confirm it with a photo. Then we peruse what I assume is a logbook, but it actually isn't. It's a cipher. Major props to Jedi Onoram on this one. And I apologies if I just butchered your name there, but good work. However, what really catches thine eyes is the medallion next to it. But before we're able to hightail it out of there, Maya Green holds us at gunpoint. Here she confesses to killing everybody. Joe Hart, Chief Inspector, Steinbeck, Dad, maybe an old man for good measure, you don't know. But Maya Green assures us we are completely safe as she points a gun at her head. Here we get the truth of the matter, her truth. Dad was a bad guy who sold out our ma for profit. Apparently the fortune teller thing is a real thing. The cult stuff is true and Delphi House is a psychic farm with Oleander Drink as their grain. Maya tells us to see for ourselves using the medallion as a key to open secret passageways. As we make our way back to Delphi House, we're informed that the intruder was a false alarm. Just Toby breaking into the pharmacy. Lloyd's Pharmacy! Lloyd's Pharmacy, one word! Back in our room, we can either lie to Blake and explore secret passages, or tell him the truth in which we get into his car, search an old farmhouse, and he winds up dead. Telling him his sweet little lie buys him more life in the narrative. Also, if you tell him the truth, you miss out on some really interesting scenes. We're gonna go with the lie here for narrative's sake. As we debriefed earlier, taking the Toby route clues us into the attic being a secret passage. Christie's route shows us the Narnia closet, but what happens if we take the Hannah route? Here is where we see the best this FMV has to offer narratively. Okay, going on a side tangent here, but hang with me. For the first time in this entire game, Erica tries to connect the dots herself and make sense of where a secret passage may lie. This is the Erica I wish we had right from the jump. A character so clued in, dialed in, that the plot is forced to have narrative depth to challenge her and thus the player channeling her. If the opposite is true, which is very much the story of Erica as it stands, then passive characters in which the world happens upon them is good character design. And I genuinely struggle with that methodology, especially when the plot itself is severely lacking. Character agency doesn't mean impeding player creativity or direction. Their very nature amplifies them. That's why I love Hannah's route so much, because while we miss out on crucial lore dump that we would otherwise get from with Toby and, and Christy here at the very least, we get Erica as a character instead of just a player playing a husk we call Erica. <sighs> Anyway, she finds a damn door. Inside the Red Room, you may think this place familiar, and you'd be right, I think. This is the chem lab where we made perfumes with Hannah, unless this is just a similar looking set, but I think it is, right? Here we can only do one thing before leaving the room. We can either open the body bag, which reveals Hannah's body, see organs in a beer cooler, or get a glimpse of Toby in regression therapy. And door number two is the regression therapy in action. There are bits of intense flashing lights here so we can skip over it. When we come out of the tunnel, what do you know? We see the very same place we've been dreaming about. We have several options here as well, but really only one of them matters and that is to open the door behind the blinds and no it cannot be opened because we have the wrong key so we bail abort mission and through the garden we go which leads us to the farmhouse the farmhouse we would have otherwise skipped toward if we told old Balake the truth now entering it alone we see an altar more oleander e-juice and get a non-consenting dose shotgun to our face now fully hopped up maya green tries to beat it into our heads that magic is real which by the by i think is the actual plot we're going with they always take three a deer a fox a rabbit they seek visions of the future for wealth and power. But they cannot see without a butterfly. 
If at this point you're holding out hope that this story would be a nuanced allegory for trauma, acceptance, guilt, or living with dissociative identity disorder, hence the Mason in Erica Mason, or self-empowerment, you're undone as I am because this story is about fortune-telling cults. How so, I say rhetorically? So let's just play ball for a second, and yes, judging by the forums and their fan wiki and my playthrough, fortune-telling cult is what we got here. Erica's story is so reliant on the FMV format that if we chart the story from start to finish, as you've probably already seen by now, there's not much here. Thus, we're reliant on what Maya Green says because, in truth, it's all we've got. For funsies, I reject her on numerous occasions because I tend to be disagreeable with stalkers, murderers, and people who spike other people's drinks. Which is honestly many folks at this point, but the narrative truth is that she's right. No matter which way you spin this and challenge Maya's actual existence, she's real. Maya's apartment is real, the people real, the ciphers are real, the oleander vapors are real. And while we'll get more into detail about different interpretations of the story later, trust, it's all real. The cult uses these girls because they're psychic, supposedly, and they juice them up and trade fortunes for fortunes, Ploki. And that's what I hate most about playing this cult plotline straight. The plot holes are immense. Maya Green then elaborates that Papa was grooming us to take Ma's place, and that Ma is still alive, definitely a misconstrued notion. She also says the purple drink can make us do whatever a sober person says, like a hyper-suggestion serum, I think? And so we take a trip through memory lane, which is honestly not very telling. The flashbacks don't illuminate squat, but you and I and the folks in the back are supposed to accept that yes, they are a cult. Yes, they are killing these women at Delphi House, and yes, Erica is meant to be there as the butterfly guide. After this debacle of a lore dump, you can choose to head back to Delphi House on your own or with her as your plus one. And you know how we love rewarding our stalkers, so I said, no dice, take a hike, and headed back alone. Which ultimately doesn't matter because remember, Maya stalks. Back at the Delphi house, the power goes out because of course it does, and Maya kills Blake. And no, there's no save the hunk route. Dude's dead, rest in pepperoni, my guy. Take this. Promise me. If you need it, use it. yet take the gun anyway. After which the Delphi house sirens go off and Erica makes her way into the creepy tunnel once more. Here you can kill Dr. Ballard by clicking the gun or let her go, whatever your mood. You ultimately save dearest Toby, or kill her if you inject her with anything other than epinephrine. Peacing out, you finally run into good old Dr. Lucian Flowers where we hear some of the best don't shoot me performances I've seen in a video game. What's happened? It's me. Please. Put the gun down. Whatever you choose here, he stirs up doubts and does his best to negotiate what you've seen with his reality. For example, if you bring up rituals, he says, nah, that ain't real. If you bring up the death of the chief inspector, he states, tis only I, Erica, was with him when the gruesome murder occurred. Also the body of Maya Green? Apparently the body is six feet under right where it should be. There is no Maya Green. What? See, Jenny boy, you judge too harshly. This is a psychological thriller after all. Multi-dimensional storytelling at its finest. No, it's not. Hang with me. In fact, it was that foolish notion that got me spiraling into this damn rabbit hole of getting all the endings and writing this already long-winded script. It's about a cult. He's a cult leader. Trust me when I say, going with anything other than culty business will only leave you with more plot holes and disappointment not in that order. Now, if you choose to lower your gun and hug it out, one of two things will happen, prior choices depending. One, you'll get secretly injected and made prisoner of Delphi House forever. Or two, you side with Lucian, thus the happy family achievement. If you kill him, you get the key and make your way to the Oleander Grove. There you see the flowers in full bloom and their powerful hallucinogenic effects. Your mama, the metaphorical oleander flowers. You get the butterfly ending by taking a gnarly hit and wearing the mask. Or you can burn the whole thing down, giving you the escape ending, greeted by your homies or not. And that's it. That's Erica in a nutshell. Congrats, you virtually played it by ear. Just sit tight. You'll be safe here. Just... Try not to make a mess.
When I finished my Let's Play of Erica, I threw out a half-baked interpretation of its story. I guessed, with no evidence, simply a hunch, that maybe these folks at Delphi House were drug pushers, and for some reason, Dr. Flowers wanted to cover his tracks by killing the disloyal, and that Maya Green was indeed a manifestation. After all, I was confused by Erica's initial story arc. Whether face value or allegorical truths or personal interpretations, none of it made any reasonable sense to me. Still, I was excited to play this game over again and make different choices. Much of the fun I have with games like FMVs is to see how wrong you are and how winding the paths may be if made winding at all. And so over and over again I played, seated for the whole experience, restarting over mouse slips, experimenting with possible benign choices, listening and clicking intently scene after scene, hoping for deeper meaning. As I mentioned earlier in this already too long review, Erica's story primarily relies on what you encounter in your first playthrough, that is to say, you only know what you know. Meaning, for example, if you answer the phone in the hallway and tell Sergeant Blake in which he replies, We're chasing the phone company, but there's still no news on last night's call. The engineers are working on it. We can't find any record of the call. And if you tell him someone's in your apartment, There's someone in my apartment. Stay here. Do not leave this room. He'll return with, nah, Erica. There's no one in your apartment, come on. And at this point, you'd be predisposed to believe that Erica must be seeing things that aren't there. The narrative attempts to build toward that goal too. Hints like choosing the face it option. It was all your fault. And breaking what you think is the butterfly mask is actually the purifier lamp. With all that in mind, we should conclude that Erica's story ain't about culty business, right? This is one of the rare occurrences when replaying a game leaves you with more questions than answers. One of my interpretations of the story was this. A young woman, still reeling from the murder of her father, is then thrust into a conspiracy when a man's hand is delivered to her doorstep. She's told the only safe place to hide is in Delphi House. There, we learn through documents, ciphers, and on Christy and Toby's accounts, the upper staff is part of a cult. They use Oleander as enhancers on their patients, and eventually Maya Green, a former patient, goes on a murderous tear, finally convincing Erica to burn the whole grove down. At least that was my initial rumination for my first handful of playthroughs. Yet that can't be it either, there are too many plot holes for even that idea to make sense. For example, we never see any kind of power used by the said all-powerful cult. So how do we know that's true? Maya Green states she delivered a call to Har's hand to our doorstep to enlighten us of the goings-on in Delphi House, but why in the world would she do that now versus any other time? How long has she been living next door? The timeline is super wishy-washy. Erica awakes to bruises on her body, and that's never touched on again. I mean, once she ends up in a different place around Delphi House, which could explain cult napping and other occurrences, but there's an option to bin the Oleander Purifier, yet she still has the ritual dream and or state of delirium no matter what you choose. Also, no one can co-sign ever seeing Maya Green, so there's that. Did you see a woman in the corridor? No, there was no one there. Not to mention that Maya tells Erica that her dad was grooming her since she was a child and kept her hopped up on Oleander, which on the onset seems plausible, but if that's the case, I hate to be that guy, but where's the toxicology report? Wouldn't this scene be prime time for either Sergeant Blake or even Erica to have that conversation and elaborate on that mysterious death and all that surrounding it, not just that it happened? And you'd think a kid on hallucinogens would make national headlines. No, unless, of course, we're going with that both Blake and Chief Inspector are also in on it, thus keeping Erica in the dark, but these follow-up scenes don't inspire confidence. Lucy insists it's a bad time for you to come and see her. We're in an important stage of her treatment. It's just not right. I don't care what he says. I want to see her. He gave me his word. You need to calm down. You're tired. Emotional. Oh, Jesus Christ, Rosa. People are dying. They took his hand. Yes, right away. This is my life's work. Do you understand that? Yeah, what exactly are you doing here, Bella? It's not for you to know. <laughs> that doesn't seem like anything's for me to know at the moment. You just do your job and concentrate on looking after Erica in a proper fashion. 
If anything, they read as Blake is a stooge following orders that he's not all privy to, and Inspector Gadget wants out from whatever they're in. I have to be good or they'll hurt him. If this is genuinely a fortune-telling cult trading futures for greenbacks, why can't they, who've been doing this for however long, find a one Maya Green and safeguard their own lives? Also, why let Erica roam free if she would just be a hassle later? So playing that plot straight is just off target, it has to be. I'm too invested now. <laughs> so if no culty business, then what? My second interpretation is where I lean into most, despite hating it with every fiber of my being. It's the interpretation with the most gaps in logic, but it's also the most universally accepted. I'm in that camp too. No fault to us trying to make sense of a game long past its glory in the limelight. It's actually an embarrassing critique on my own mental fortitude, having been bothered by it still. <laughs> But here it is. Erica Mason as a child killed her father, and as an adult, she conjures up the existence of Maya Green. Somehow, she kills everyone, maybe confusing the pliers for a knife, and goes on a deadly tear throughout the psychiatric hospital Delphi house. Now you may be thinking, well, how do you explain the whole other apartment, the only Andrew juice, a call Jahar's hand, the random timing of it all? How'd she get a gun? Again, I don't know. The best way to bridge the gap here is that Maya Green is a real person in both Erica and she go on a bloody rampage, even then that's grasping at straws, Erica's story is intentionally unclear. It's easier for them not to commit to meaning than create a story with meaning. It's the Audi 5000 don't strain your brain thinking too hard. And that's generally where people find themselves between those two camps, with varying ideas of the in-between. Some taking a guess that Erica never left Delphi House when she was a child. Whatever suits your fancy as this story relies heavily on audience interpretation rather than making a statement itself, a sandbox not deep enough to comfortably jump around in. As I mentioned at the top of the video, I can't stop thinking about Erica's story or lack thereof. Maybe it was the notion of exploring the psychological toll of trauma or the personal grieving process and subsequent transformation that may stem from it, perhaps subverting the expectation of how popular media portrays mental health disorders by writing a story that explores the multifaceted lives of people living with dissociative identity disorder or even challenging and addressing the controversial topic of its existence. I mean, Erica's last name of Mason is there for a reason, right? She's named after Shirley Mason, the first documented case of someone diagnosed with DID. Shirley Mason would later confess to lying about her experiences, yet DID is still professionally diagnosed to this day. Many people share that they have multiple fragmented personalities that stem from kinds of earlyhood childhood trauma, or maybe that it's a part of a larger framework with PTSD in general. I thought Erica's story would touch on the matter. After all, why write about it? Surely, there was more thought and care put into it than a simple name drop. If you have an opportunity to write stories given the platform, why not tackle these themes with sincerity and create meaningful narratives? And I do think a meaningful narrative is here somewhere out there buried in the muck. For me, Erica's screenplay has all the makings of something special and a few tweaks in the dialogue here build up to this scene a little there and you've got something more telling than what we have here. I suppose that's what fascinates me most about Erica. The gameplay, of course, the film direction and set design, certainly, but the element of what if. What if we dared to make our main protagonist more exciting and more part of the world? You know, write Erica well enough to convey to the player that she has what it takes to redirect any eventual end. What if we wrote against making a passive main character? There is intentionality to a passive main character. They don't make decisions that drive the plot, the plot happens upon them, which keeps your passive character in a complete state of reaction, which sounds perfect for an FMV, no? As a player, you react to the world, Erica being your conduit, you know, I can see an argument that can be made that Erica is an active protagonist by an FMV's very nature. After all, it's the player who drives the game, drives the course of her life, you push plot. But you don't. Not really. Other characters move Erica. Our choices are within the scope of the hardline narrative. The bits you get to change come at the tail end of the climax without concrete resonance to prior scenes. In that case, more egregious is that both the main character and the player are made to be passive with the narrative happening upon us. Remember when I said earlier that Erica could be played as a hands-off experience, a passive experience in choices and scenes strung together, able to move without player input? 
that is a passive game in FMV form. Resultingly, you get scenes that are dull or repeat the same information over and over again when you think you should be uncovering more mystery. And despite my qualms, I enjoyed this FMV. And I think conceptually, Erica has a great story in the making. That is why I'd like to try my hand in some fun course correction. A creative exercise, god forbid a physical one. Let's try within the framework of the narrative and rewrite portions of Erica's story. Please join me, a simple near-do-well, on this journey nobody asked for. And I invite you to write along, so please grab a pencil and paper, put on some stereotypical dreary lo-fi to get the mood right, and let's try this thought experiment. Can we write Erica as an active character that earns her endings? Who do I think I am? What gives me the right? Okay, all jokes aside, I'm well aware that saying we can improve or rewrite Erica presents its own form of arrogance. That I, some strange internet sleuth, not for crimes but for FMV games, can say, hey, let's indulge in some creative exploitation because that's what this is, folks. The very act of this segment is unfair, so much so I have that unconfident pit in my stomach warning me, advising me, reminding me humility or diarrhea. If I did not convey thoroughly enough, I love Erica. My genuine fascination manifests itself into whatever it is that you're watching now. Indulging in a rewrite derives from a place of gratitude that this game exists, and I will be the first to say I am no writing talent, I am a nobody. What writer Connor Potts and game designer Faye Windsor-Smith brought to life in the form of this game changes the way we view FMVs. By writing Erica and merging it with interactive touch gameplay, new transformative art emerges into the ether. They're pushing storytelling boundaries in the face of criticism. Criticisms like and unlike my own, and there's criticisms in bunches whenever you try to art. They deserve their praise. Let's not get that twisted. My desire to critique, challenge, and indulge in a bit of fanfic I wholeheartedly blame? on my English professors. Yeah, I studied English in college and even then I don't do that the bestest, as you've noticed. Yet for funsies, I enjoy breaking this down as if we're in the same writer's cohort, knowing full well I'm just some internet rando. The enablers, the lot of them. Yet here it is, my exposition rewrite because this FMV has me too damn arrested to do anything else. Character motivation is everything. It is the fuel to get us to the end of the story when all roads leading to it run out. It can be subtle or extreme, Erica just needs the one. We also have the advantage of Erica as an unreliable narrator, so let's lean on that. Within the framework of Erica's existing narrative, let's tweak the exposition. After breaking down Erica's narrative, we know where the writing wants us to go. It's either we believe old papa is grooming and doping us for culty business, or we remain in denial. Erica. You shouldn't play with it. It's dangerous. The end goal is to make our papa a bad guy, but the best bad guys are good guys, in their mind. So instead, let's try lines like, it's not yours to inhale. After which, he disappointingly moves away from the oleander perfume. Or maybe he angrily moves it away and says, who let you, and interrupts himself. He notices Erica attuning, then grabs some pictures of the fireplace, then proceeds to give the test. Let's aim to get questions going like, is dad really bad? Did he deserve to die? Was dad really a bad guy? With that angle in place, let's instill some self-fulfilling doubts. Don't worry. I still think you're magic. See? Magic. These lines become thematically lost, only to appear late. Instead, let's have Erica view her world through that lens, and possibly have that change in the end. I don't believe in rituals and magic. The hope is to include more moments like this throughout the narrative. That way, it doesn't feel out of place. Admittedly, this incoming change is a bit more intrusive. While it doesn't necessarily change the trajectory of the original five endings, my goal here is to eliminate plot holes. As Erica awakes from her nightmare and goes to face herself in the mirror, she's then alerted by banging on the door. This is where we get our first introduction to Maya Green, not as a neighbor, but as a police officer on a welfare check. She gives her a line of questioning and asks about Erica's well-being. Erica replies with degrees of, I'm well, who asked for this, it's late, I'd like to go to bed. Let's create tension from real-world scenarios via police handling to welfare checks. We can also learn that Erica is in between work and has trouble holding on to jobs. Satisfied with the welfare check, Officer Green leaves by saying, Miss Mason, help is here if you need it, ending the encounter. 
My handling of Maya Green effectively cuts that later apartment scene. To solve this problem, have Steinbeck's dead body in the garden or somewhere on the property. Leading up to it, we have scenes where Erica awakes in different parts of Delphi House. Just gaslight her with, can you explain where you were when this event occurred? By doing that, you get the same effect as you would the apartment scene. With Officer Green gone, Erica investigates her wall of drawings, especially the symbol etched into her father's chest. Her mannerisms convey to us the regularity of this passion turned obsession. And she's close to figuring it out, mayhaps, a visit to Delphi House that final hurdle. Dr. Ballard's suspect number one on her list. In our adjustment, Erica never stopped looking for her father's killer or the why of it all. The past haunts her and she desires answers. She's unsure how to get it or if any of it is a trick of the mind. No closer despite years of consolidated effort. Yet finally, sleep takes her. Erica awakes the next morning to the same kind of banging on her door. Tired, maybe angry and annoyed, she races to her door to shoo away who she thinks is Officer Green. Instead, we get our hand in the box. She notices the medallion, curious of the similarity, then we cut to our introduction with Sergeant Blake. As Sergeant Blake introduces himself, he sees the many pages of wall art. The original scene reads like a casual sit-down. Instead, let's heighten conflict by participating with the set. Sergeant Blake notices a picture on the wall reminiscent of her father's scars. Curious about the symbology, he asks. You draw this a lot. It's Greek, isn't it? Erica can then answer that it's Delphic Epsilon or question what Sergeant Blake is alluding to, to which he admits into reading into her father's case. The change I've made here is that Erica's journal is not present and there's no implied discovery of the medallion, as she's pocketed both. Erica is in the know about some things, even if the player isn't privy to it. As for the journal, it's a wasted opportunity not to have that more involved. So let's have the journal serve as an anchor in the narrative that Erica uses to piece together this mystery. And for funsies, we also establish that Erica is both sly and doesn't trust law enforcement due to their handling of her father's case. The goal here is to develop Erica's voice through action, as well as establishing player decisions that complement that action. Did you know he co-founded Delphi House with this man, Lucian Flowers? In Sergeant Blake's line of questioning, he brings up Dr. Lucian Flowers in which Erica admits knowing him. She states, He helped found Delphi House, the private psychiatric hospital and pharmaceutical company with my father. My inheritance comes from that place? What? Yes, folks, we are looking to plug all the plot holes. God, I hate how sexual that sounded. We explain away Erica's financial situation as well as further entrench our character into the plot. Sergeant Blake explains that Dr. Flowers may be the next target and that they've set up a perimeter around Delphi House. Erica, feeling unsafe all a ploy, asks if she could hold up there and wait for all of this to blow over. But really, she sees this as an opportunity to get into the place with coppers around. If there's a good time to get to the root of this mess, it's now. Yes, we're a little out of bounds by removing Maya Green as the primary antagonist, but honestly, we can get the same effect by just committing to the characters we have. That doesn't mean Maya Green won't appear again or on our case Officer Green, but we should be mindful of the reason Maya Green exists in the narrative in the first place. Now, I just want to be clear about this. This is my personal interpretation of Maya Green and may not reflect the intentionality of the screenplay. My reading of Maya Green is that she's portrayed as either a mass murdering ex-cult member or Erica's alter a fragment of her personality, maybe a bit of both, never really committing to either. If we go with Erica has DID via her name connection, Shirley Mason, Erica Mason, then Erica's story caters to a misunderstanding of DID, which is concerning if the writing is trying to make that association, especially if by including the Fox and Maya Green as possible alters, thereby meeting DID's two or more identity requirements. If the themes in Erica exist to stigmatize people with DID or by and large people with mental health disorders by creating a violent mass murdering alter as Maya Green, then I'd advocate to write differently here. To replace Maya Green entirely, it's a simple fix. And there are elements of it already in the script. For the murders, have all the doctors gaslight Erica at every turn. They try to pin her for it and get her committed before she's able to find clues that expose her father's killers. You can still work in the original narrative premise as well, in that she's secretly drugged by oleander perfume, thus keeping her in varying states of delirium. And allow me to emphasize delirium, which is different than DID. Delirium can be medically or chemically induced, which fits the oleander angle. We know oleander is toxic, but whatever, movie magic or go with that they are a vile fortune-telling cult. In that case, give Erica the ability to deja vu future events. 
explainable or unexplainable. Hell, use Erica's journal as a picture book that predicts events before they happen. The drawing's only concise when she's hopped up on Oleander. And by no means am I saying that you can't explore DID, especially in Erica's story. If so determined to keep Maya green and that Erica does have DID, then more work is required in the exposition phase. And the writer should constantly remind themselves that alters are fragments of the center personality, and rarely are they ever violent. The idea that Erica can flip to a serial killer like Maya Green at the drop of a hat is troubling to what is and what's not being said here. The way the narrative claims no responsibility via its non-committal nature, which, if we're being honest, doesn't make it clever, rather cowardly and kowtowing to ignorant uncertainty. By entwining characters, plots, and themes and practicing basic storytelling principles, we create more opportunities to elaborate on possibilities. In doing so, we don't have to stigmatize mental health disorders for a half-baked plot, as is so often the case with popular media. Character development, agency, and motivation only serve to uplift this already fun premise. As I mentioned earlier, I really, really, really do enjoy Erica the game as a whole, in totality. It's just narratively, they often fall short of fulfilling some of their own ideas. Nice of you to come visit. I hear you're being stalked by a psycho killer. Is that true? Erica is so well filmed for an FMV, and the performances and the set design and the costume design are all incredibly nuanced. Erica truly is one of the better FMVs out there, and I only wish it had a story to match. Of course, all that I've said is incredibly subjective and to each their own when it comes to depth. While I have my peeves about it, you might find Erica to be the best story you've ever done seen, and I think that's equally valid too. I think that's where Erica has me in raps, it's their narrative potential. Now that I've finished Erica through and through, I'm just disappointed with an experience that I weirdly greatly appreciate. I don't know how that even makes sense, but when I think of the reason for even making this video, it comes from the fact that this FMV, despite at times disagreeable, somehow inspired me. This isn't my first rodeo in the FMV genre, and no, I'm not a connoisseur on the topic either. Yet, as a layman, uh, Erica truly stands out for me, and I want to be one of those folks who can point to it and say, hey, FMVs can be more than what's on the tin. Erica proves it so. Erica can be well acted, well filmed, and with new and fun gameplay, which Erica has all in a bag of chips, okay? I don't know how, why so many 90s idioms made it into the script. I guess what I'm trying to say is that games can be good, and Erica is good, and yet does not have the best story. Revolutionary, I, I know. Uh, nor should we be afraid to take stories to task in a meaningful way rather than surface level talk. Erica is one of those games that I would recommend to anyone interested in FMVs while being mindful that the narrative has backward elements. But nothing in this world has to be perfect for it to be appreciated. At least, that's what I tell myself in the mirror every morning. Jesus, it's hideous. All that and a bag of chips. I'm, okay, I'm sorry, I'm done. Thank you for watching this weirdly chaotic video essay. I wasn't sure if anyone would even enjoy something like this, but if you're here, then you enjoyed it, and uh, I thank you so much for being here. Um, this is probably the longest video essay I've ever made in my life, and my voice is dying. Hey, I have a quick question. So this scene with Maya Green and getting through this damn door, I never figured out how to do it, and I like remained undetective, never seen by the camera. Did you figure it out? Does anyone even know if there's another part to this? Or is it like a vestige of the script that never got filmed in a follow-up scene? Because that's what it felt like. You know, we'll never know. I'll never know. That'll be up there with the Yeti, the four-leaf clover, if Tupac really is on an island.